all phenomena are rooted in desire. It's one of the basic principles in the Buddhist teachings. And it applies to your meditation right now. Make sure you desire the right things. Different desires will come up, some of them wanting to stay with the breath, some of them wanting to wander off. So hold on to the desires that want to stay. Because who knows your, where you wander off to. But if you stay with the breath, you can get the mind in a state of concentration. The concentration can give rise to discernment. The discernment will help you see through all these processes by which desire creates things. And you get to the point where you can go beyond. Whereas if you wander off, who knows where you end up? Probably just coming back to your same old desires that you've been mucking around in for who knows how long. Staying on the path gives you the prospect of something new. And you do practice with desire. We often hear that craving is the cause of suffering, and that's true. But the Buddha points out three cravings in particular. Craving for sensuality, becoming, non-becoming. That's in the second noble truth. But in the fourth noble truth, he points out that the desire to develop what's skillful and abandon what's skillful is the path to the end of suffering. So not all desire is bad. You want to get to know your desires really well and be able to sort them out. This is a useful skill to develop not only while you're here meditating, but as you go through life and as you approach death. Because the process of desiring is what will take you on to another life. You want to make sure you choose your desires well. There was a wanderer who came to see the Buddha one time and asked him, what is it that sustains a being from one life to the next? And the Buddha says, it's craving. In the same way that wind sustains fire as it goes from one house to the next. The thing is that that's not the only time when you're sustained by your desire, sustained by your craving. As you go through your life day by day by day, this is what defines you as a being. Notice that when the wanderer asked that question of the Buddha, the Buddha gave him a straight answer. Beings are sustained by craving. If the wanderer had asked some modern Buddhists, they might have said, well, there really is no being there anyhow. There's no continued identity, so there's nothing to go from one to the next. Which these people really are adrift when they die and they find that they're not ending. We sometimes think that the Buddha simply picked up his teachings on rebirth from his culture. But the way he taught rebirth is very different. For one thing, not everybody in his culture believed in it. Some said there was no rebirth, and the way they would try to settle the issue would be by trying to find well, what you are. What is this thing? Is, and can this thing be reborn or not be, be reborn? Now, the Buddha took it as one of the basic principles of mundane right view. That there is an, the next world. In other words, there is life after death. But he didn't get involved in the terms of the discussion. He didn't say what it is that goes on. He said, this is how it happens. And how it happens is what it's the same thing as what happens to define you as a being. Your craving, your attachments. The only people who are not beings are arahants. This is why they don't get reborn. We create our identity as beings and we sustain it with our craving. Then we find you can't stay here in this body. You would grab at whatever. And if you're not prepared, you will grab at whatever. The mind is capable of all kinds of things. As the Buddha said, it's more variegated than the animal kingdom. All the different animals that you can think of in the earth, on land, and sea. 
come from the craving of the mind. You look at all the different shapes and forms it can take. So when you're counseling someone who's facing death, that's what you want to keep in mind. That the mind is capable of grabbing on, holding on to anything. And so you want to make sure that the person holds on to good things. The Buddha's first advice is to ask if they're worried about anything. Usually it might be with their family, unfinished business. And the Buddha says, just put that aside. You're dying now. There's nothing you can do for the family. There's nothing you can do for your unfinished business. The nature of the world is that all its business is unfinished. So tell the person who's passing away not to expect closure and to focus instead on the state of his or her mind. The next question is, are you afraid of leaving your body? Are you afraid of leaving human sensuality? And if the person says yes, the Buddha's first answer is really interesting. He says, there are levels of being where the sensuality is better. Aim your mind there. Now this will depend on what that person's belief systems are. If the person is dying, you don't want to impose something new on them. But one thing that is important is that where the mind is holding on will create a state of mind that will either be lifted up or pulled down. So have the person think of the things that will lift him or her up. In other words, the goodness they've done, not the good times they've had. If you have them thinking about the good times they've had, they get depressed. But things at the times they've been generous, they've been virtuous, and they've shown their goodwill to others. Have them focus their mind there. In other words, give the mind something good to hold on to. And the Buddha does go on to say if the person is capable, you might say, well, even the best thing you can hold on to would be a self-identity, and self-identities are going to change and end. It would be better if you could let go of the need for self-identity. In other words, stop defining yourself as a being. Let go, totally. But for a lot of people, that's, that's not in the cards. So instead, you have them focus on the good they've done. That way, when different possibilities will open up to them as they find that they can't stay in the body, they'll have the confidence that they have some good to them. There's no reason why they have to go down. The Johns in Thailand talk about two kinds of visions that appear to a person passing away. One is visions of their past actions, and the other is visions of where they can go. And if you've been focusing on some past bad actions, then if a vision of a bad place to go comes up, then you're likely just to fall for it. Because that is one of the things we fear as we approach death that maybe there might be some punishment for the bad things we've done in life. This is one of the reasons why people who have done things bad often like to comfort themselves with the idea that, well, maybe everything was predetermined, they didn't have any choice, they're not responsible, and therefore they won't get punished. But that's not how things work. But the important thing to keep in mind is that there are only a very few things that would absolutely ensure that you would have to go down. Killing your parents, killing an arahant. And as long as you haven't done any of those things, then you're, you've got the possibility that you could go up. As the Buddha said, that's part of the complexity of karma. There are some times when you do something bad in this lifetime, but you don't suffer in the next, and vice versa. You do good things in this lifetime and you suffer in the next. Because the karma you're dealing with is not only the karma now in this lifetime, but from the past. 
And also has to do with whether you change your mind in the course of your life. This is why so much emphasis is placed on the state of the mind as you're dying. And that's asking for an awful lot, because as you're dying, you're dealing with the fact that the body is not cooperating anymore. The things it used to do for you, it's not doing. Another reason why we meditate is to develop the strength of mind that doesn't have to depend on the strength or the functioning of the body. So work on your mind here, because it does determine how you're living, who you are, in this lifetime and as you go to the next. And it is possible to change the mind. Past karma is not ironclad. It creates tendencies. But we can develop the skills in the present moment so we can deal even with bad tendencies and not suffer from them. So this principle of having choice in the present moment is a really important part of the practice. You do have the choice to develop the mind, or you have the choice to do something else. The Buddha took this so seriously that even though he wasn't the sort of person who went around picking fights, he would go out and search out teachers who he heard had taught that you don't have choice. Or if you do have choice, it doesn't matter because your actions don't have any results. Those kinds of teachings, the Buddha said, are really detrimental. And the people who teach that do a lot of harm, which is why he felt it was important even to seek these people out and see if he could change them, or at least let other people know that that kind of teaching was dangerous. As in his words, it leaves you unprotected and bewildered. You don't want to be unprotected and bewildered as you're going through life, and especially as you're facing death. So how confident is that you can change the mind? You have that choice. And the mind does have possibilities, many of which are more than you can imagine. So you want the mind to be trained in the direction where it will go for the best possibilities. So keep in mind the principle of choice and have the confidence that, yes, you can learn how to make better and better choices. If that weren't possible, the Buddha wouldn't have taught. The fact that he did teach after getting awakening is a sign that he wanted us to take this as a working hypothesis, that we do have choices. Because it's not until you gain your first taste of awakening that you really know for sure that, yes, you have choices. And they can become so skillful that they can lead you to the end of suffering. That's when you know. Up to that point, it's a matter of we don't like to use the word faith. I use the word conviction. But it is a working hypothesis. Act on it, and the Buddha says, you'll benefit. Everybody who's reached awakening says, you'll benefit. And they're the kind of people you want to believe. <laughs>